Happy New Year, everybody. Woohoo! <clears throat> everybody maintaining your resolutions, your commitments. Right. Right. I, uh, I make the same resolution every year to not eat Brussels sprouts and liver, and I'm staying on it. Staying on it. And, and I love this time of the year because um, you see a lot of before and after pictures and advertisements for gyms and diets and books. Uh, and, and I love the before pictures. They're always taken in the worst possible light. You've noticed this, right? They're always sort of... Sort of and then the after pictures are always, you know, sucking everything in and chin extended and just looking so as good as possible as you can. And, and the problem with before and after pictures, it makes you think instant, instant me, instant change. And you don't see the mushy middle that, that real life takes. Uh, real life is changes on a day-to-day -day basis. And friends, I want to encourage you, along with Pastor Ken, on the beginning of 2018, that um, the Bible is about change. And God is interested in you and I changing and making real progress. In fact, God has invested in you. And God's Spirit, I believe, wants to be working in you for real change and, and progress, transformation. So here's my tip for the new year. Uh, in 2018, say no to just complete discouragement because that won't help you. And we believe we are good news people, that God is about life and good news and, and discouragement does not ultimately help us. I would encourage you to say yes this year to discovery. Uh, no to discouragement because God's not finished with you yet. And if ever you are completely discouraged this year, I would give you a prescription to read Romans chapter 8. That's just tuck that away. And remember this mushy middle but between the before and after pictures that God is working in you, in your choices, learning from your failures, learning from your mistakes, saying no to just ultimate discouragement, but saying yes to discovery because we're not going through life blind. We're not going to go through this new year blind. Jesus, as Pastor Ken was saying, I believe Jesus today is inviting us to follow him in this new year. So let's learn how to do that. If you brought your Bibles or if you have a Bible app, uh, we are going to be reading from uh, the Gospel according to Mark. We're in chapter 8. And this is a scene in which Jesus is with his disciples, and it is a profound teaching following moment. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves 
and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Lord, we thank you for this reading of your holy word. Help us now, Spirit, to hear your voice. Lord, please help me with my words. Help us, Jesus, to hear you and to follow you. Amen. DTR stands for Define the Relationship. I think this is where following and change begins. We need to continually define the relationship. Because, friends, I believe you becoming a better you is never just about you. For all the philosophies and theories of self-development that leave you alone and pondering sitting on a rock, I don't care if it's yoga or transcendental hypergalyption, you ain't going to get there without God. You know, sometimes I find myself getting caught up in stupid conversations. Yeah, I feel like I need change, but you know, I've just got to figure that out for myself, by myself. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to do meditation, but you know, on my own, my own way. I just need a spiritual center. I just need to find myself. Now, I'm generally a gentle, caring, and respectful person in conversations like these, and my aim is to be helpful. But sometimes I just want to shout and say, Wake up and smell the glory of someone in this world, someone who has created this world, created you, someone who has invaded this world so that we can have victory over death. Friends, if you and I are going to change and grow this year, the best change will not happen without you and I defining the relationship we have with God. You know, when I talk to grown-ups who are self-focused, and you can read that as self-confused, sometimes, sometimes I just want them to listen to some of the children in this church. Uh, just, for example, just listen for a moment to the testimonies of some of our Northminster kids and their friends that were captured just last Sunday while they were here at church. Who is Jesus to you? Jesus is my everything. God. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. He, I am a servant to Jesus. He's my master. The most beautiful person in the whole wide world, God. Jesus is the person who saved us all from sin. Jesus to me is my best friend. Love. To me, Jesus is everything. Jesus is Jesus Christ that comes to church every Sunday with me. Jesus is my father to me. Jesus is a savior. Jesus to me, is my close friend. I'm never alone when Jesus is here. To me, Jesus is God who came to save me. The Savior. Everything. A person that could help us do stuff that's impossible. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Tell me something about Jesus. 
that he died on the cross for us. Jesus is grace, forgiveness, love offered to all people. He's kind, respectful, responsible, and he has fun. Jesus is always with us, even when we're driving. That he loves us no matter what happens. That Jesus died, and he was, uh, he was crucified, and he died for our sins. Jesus gave his life on the cross to save all of us. He in my spirit, in my soul, and everywhere with me when I grow. That he loves us no matter if we do something bad. Jesus is our savior. He's the best friend I can count on. Love. Jesus is a savior. Jesus was born on Christmas Eve. Jesus asks, what about you? Who do you say I am? Powerful testimonies. Amen. Jesus is with me when I'm driving. Praise God. I, I, the other day, before I went into this dangerous intersection, I actually genuflected. I said, Lord, please. I did, seriously. Our God goes with us, driving, walking. He's our friend. He's our Savior and Lord. DTR, what about you? You know, a great way to define your relationship with God is by looking at the example of Peter in our story today from the Gospel of Mark. I've often told folks that chapter 8 in the Gospel of Mark can be called the mountain peak of Mark's Gospel. And here's why. I call it a mountain peak because everything in the Gospel of Mark, the story of Jesus told by Mark, everything leads up, 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 up to chapter 8, to this apex question, who do you say I am? And then after chapter 8, it descends down, down, down with entrapment, challenges, interrogation, torture, Jesus being executed on a cross. Who do people say I am? Now this general question was not too hard, I think, for the disciples. Some are saying John the Baptist somehow came back. Some are saying Elijah, back from the dead. Some people are saying you're just a real special prophet, Jesus. And then Jesus asks a DTR question, doesn't he? What about you? Who do you say I am? And I'm wondering if there were some posture reactions at that moment. You know? Some disciples looking at the ground. Maybe kicking a rock, thinking. Maybe a little of this. And it was Peter. Blessed Peter. He nails it. He says it out loud. You are the Messiah. And it's been pointed out that the only way this fisherman could say something like that was obviously with God's help. But he says it. And then Jesus immediately warns them not to bring this up because he still needs to suffer. Jesus reports that he's going to have to be killed first and then rise again. And Jesus immediately stresses that his mission as Messiah would have to go through pain and suffering love first. And it reaches a point where it seems as if Peter can't take it anymore. We read, it's astonishing, that Peter takes Jesus aside and begins to rebuke him. Jesus. It's, it's like sitting in a movie theater and hearing a little boy four seats away say, uh-oh, here comes the scary part. Rebuking Jesus? Jesus turns to Mr. Get the Answer Right. Jesus turns to Mr. Star Pupil and says, Get behind me, Satan. No worse words from Jesus' mouth were ever spoken to a Pharisee, to a scribe, to an enemy. But he says this to his friend, a disciple. 
Jesus says, you don't have in mind the things of God. You're only thinking about human things. And this is a two-emoji moment, right, friends? And by the way, welcome to real life with Jesus. Peter slams the three-point shot, the game-winning goal with his declaration, you are the Messiah. Whoa! Smiley face. Woohoo! We love that. A plus, Peter. You aced it. Yeah! But when Jesus talks about hard work, struggle, even suffering, sacrifice, even death, well, that's just not what Peter had in mind for his version of Jesus. That's not what his hero was about. Thank you very much. Bummer! This is the other emoji. And friends, Peter's life is a tale of two emojis, and so is ours. We've got to be realistic in our following. And this is why I say the gospel of Jesus does not allow for ultimate discouragement. God, in his love, friends, is eager to accept you just as you are. But because of his love for you, he doesn't want you to remain as you are. This Peter would be distracted with a temptation of Satan for Jesus to follow a human course of power and achievement and conquest. But this Peter would become, by God's grace, the great leader of the Christian church, the rock of Christianity, whose faith and ministry would hold the keys of life and death, keys that the church holds still to this day. So friends, we have our ups and our downs, our smileys and our frowns. The Christian life, your Christian life, is not just simple, always smiling emojis. But God wants to be transforming you one day at a time between the before and up until the after in this middle through the power of His Holy Spirit working in you, through our baptism, through God's presence here at this table, and through the real challenges we will face in this new year. But here's what we need to learn. Jesus is the Messiah, and He will be the Messiah for you on God's terms, not yours, not mine. And we need to accept that, and we need to rejoice in that, because God's terms are correct. You know, when I get frustrated, I have to remember that sometimes I have trouble putting IKEA bookshelves together with the simple no-word instructions laid out in front of me. Why should I think Jesus should be Messiah on my terms? No. Secondly, we need to realize that Jesus is asking us, you and me, to follow him this new year. How do we follow him? Well, it begins by remembering he is the Messiah on God's terms, not ours. But it means that to be a disciple, that it's more about being sacrificial than it is successful. Friends, this means that the way of the disciple is not about getting and getting and getting as it is about giving and giving. Following Jesus means a life of self-renunciation because that's how we find self-transformation. This is how we move from dying to living. Following Jesus also means that it's more about following than just being a fan. This is what Ken shared with the kids. To follow Jesus should always be more than just talk. Now please, our lives and the life of this church, yes, it is built on the testimony of saying that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of this world and me. Amen. But when you say that, when you say Jesus is alive in me, we need to see a pulse. That's why your life as a Christian must always be tell and show, word and deed. We follow Jesus when we love God and others as our chief commands. 
When we give our lives away in love, in Jesus' name. When we understand that God wants us to be his demonstrator models in the, church, in the world today. We, the church, are God's demo. You see, not only do we all live in a tale of two emojis, ups and downs, but friends, maybe this is a better comparison metaphor that Jesus is asking of you this year. Are you this, just an excited fan, for Jesus, or this year will you be this? Yeah. A player on the field who's not always carrying a trophy. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. As we begin 2018, meditate on that question. Are you just a fan or are you a follower? Some years back, I, I read this story about a pastor in San Diego. It was the Monday after worship, and his custodian at the church asked him to come into the sanctuary to see something. Someone had left some clothes on the communion table. And it was an old, dirty pair of brown corduroy pants, a belt, and a white t-shirt that had blood stains on it. And next to the clothes was a note that said, please listen to God, and there was a phone number. So the pastor called the number, and he heard the story of this 19-year-old young man who had been a drifter, a runaway. He told about how that night he had gotten into a fight, and he almost killed someone. But then he was seized with a conviction, and he practically carried this person to the hospital, and rejoiced to hear that he would make it, he would recover. And then he said he just walked to the nearest church, found an unlocked door, and went into the sanctuary. And he said he pretty much spent the night in there crying, praying, seeking God, thinking about his life. And he asked God to forgive him and show him the way. And he said all at once, to the pastor. He says, all at once, God's presence became very real to him. He suddenly knew that God was there for him and that he could receive God's forgiveness. And he said, a wonderful peace came over him. And he committed himself then and there to follow Jesus for the rest of his life. He said he was determined to make things right, all the things he had messed up, because he said he felt like a new man fresh and clean. And so to symbolize this new life and direction, he put on a new set of clothes that he had in his backpack, and he left his old stained clothes on the communion table. And he said he walked out of there with a new life and a new hope. You know, friends, please listen to God. I hope that right here, right now, January 7th, that God's presence will be made known to you. I hope that at this table, you can just take off your past, leave it here, and receive Christ's presence, Spirit, that from this time together, you will not be a follower. Or you will not be a fan of Jesus. You will become a follower, walking in his way of love. Will you pray with me? Lord God, teach us today and each day of this year how to watch for you, to receive you, and to follow you, Lord. Show us how to sacrifice and serve. Show us, Lord, how to pick up our cross and follow in your mission of love. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen.